and welcome. Tonight, I am joined by fellow horror narrator Creaks and Peaks, who has kindly agreed to run a competition with me on this special video. Don't forget that you can hear more stories narrated by both of us over on her channel after this one, so please be sure to go check that out after. And to make it even sweeter, we're running a competition. During the course of this video, you will be able to see an artwork being created. It is the same one used in the thumbnail. And you can win a signed copy of this artwork by doing the following. Subscribe to both Mortis Media and Creaks and Peaks, and be sure to drop a like and leave a comment in both videos as part of this collaboration. That's it. The competition will end in exactly one week. So get your entries in, and I hope to see you over on Creaks and Peaks' channel after this. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I have two stories. Both take place in New Zealand. The first one takes place in November 2011. My grandfather had just died a couple of days before this story took place. My grandmother on my father's side runs a bed and breakfast out in the countryside with her considerably older partner. The family had gathered out there because it was the last day that my grandfather's brother and his wife were in town, as they had come up for the wake and lived down near Dunedin. We were talking down in the larger of the two sitting rooms which was at the back of the house. For some reason, my brother and I were told to leave, as the adults wanted to discuss something somewhat sensitive. So we went for a walk. We walked outside, and down past the end of a house between a pond and a large garden shed. Beyond that was a large open field, with nothing in it but grass. Next to the shed was a small house that my aunt, my father's sister, used to rent but had new tenants. Beyond that was another field and the main shed driveway, but the other houses further down it used to get to the road, which was about a kilometre away. We began walking to the back of the property and we were joined by my grandmother's two Burmese cats, who had run of the place. About halfway down the drive, between the house and the back of the property, the cats sat down in the middle of the driveway and wouldn't move. We tried calling them, and they wouldn't budge. So my brother and I continue. We come to a cattle stop at the back of the property, and for some reason, I am overcome with a sense of absolute dread and fear. Like if we were to cross this cattle stop, something bad will happen to us. I also felt like I was being watched, but I couldn't see behind me, because the field was obscured behind a row of six foot tall pampa grass bushes. So we walk back accompanied by both cats. On the way back, we walk past the rental and I look through the bushes into the house. It has an open front with large windows and a ranch slider door. Yes, I'm a nosy bugger, and no one was home. We get back inside and sit down. Not long after we get back, there is this hideous scream like a woman being murdered. And this scream is loud, and sounded like it was coming from next door. And at the time of the scream, everyone was silent, and everyone was silent afterwards. I eventually asked if anyone heard the scream, and everyone said they did. And I distinctly remember my mother saying, it was a banshee. Now I have said this story many times, and had suggestions from a lot of people of what the sound sounds like, and the closest animal 
that could have made the sound is a mountain lion. Now, that all sounds like case closed. Except New Zealand doesn't have any wild big cats. All large felines present in New Zealand are in zoos. No other animals outside a human could make that scream. The feeling of fear and dread could be partially explained as I wasn't very familiar with the property and therefore could be something psychological. My second story takes place at my own house. I used to have my laptop and computer in a front corner of the living room that has a corner window. And from that window was a view over the side gate, the boundary fence and a very short strip of land between it and the five meter drop down the banks to the river below. Beyond that is one of the many bridges the street crosses as it winds its way up the valley. I'm sitting there, it's about 11.30 at night, and both my parents are in bed. I have my headphones on, and I'm just listening to music, which isn't too loud, but enough that I can't hear very much unless it's particularly loud. So I hear a loud thump on the side window. I pause my music, and start hearing scratching noises, like something dragging claws down the window. I think nothing of it, because one of the cats uses that method at the front door. We too have a ranch slider, to get let inside. Then it strikes me, neither of the cats are big enough to stretch across the gap between the fence and the side of the house. Even our youngest cat, who is an 8 kilo fat ass that can stretch close to the top of our dining chairs, so I open the window and catch the glimpse of something darting beneath the windowsill. But it's like I was catching the very underneath of its front, as I only saw what looked to be like the mouth and two very, very long whiskers, like those of a catfish. So I open up the window and look outside. I see nothing, which is understandable because there is a considerable overhang between the side of the house and the skirting that goes around the piles. So I think nothing more of it. And I was in the kitchen filling up a drink bottle. I turned on the kitchen light and something darts out from underneath the house and makes a run for the back fence. However, because of the ways the shadows are, I didn't see it. What I remember of it is something the size of a border collie, but very muscular and lithe, and the way it moved was distinctly feline. I told my parents about it the next day, and they got a proper look at the window where it happened, because I saw what might have been the underside of its face. I am operating under the assumption that it was likely standing on its hind legs and scratching down the window. The problem was, the distance between the ground and where I heard the thud against the window and the scratching noise was at least six feet. And it might have been a feral cat, but I don't know of any feral cats that could stretch up to six feet on their hind legs. Lately, I've been thinking about this recurring vague childhood memory. I have some memory issues due to various reasons, abuse, blackouts, and previous heavy alcohol and drug use, as well as denial. Please remember that this is very vague. My mother and brothers would visit friends who had once lived on our street, but had moved to a farm. I was little, between the ages of seven, and there was a little girl I would play with named Kerry who was my age. We would play around the farm feeding chickens, catching tadpoles in the stream, and doing farm stuff. On one of these visits, I remember it being a beautiful hot summer's day. Kerry wanted to show me something. We walked through the golden dry wheat fields. If anyone 
has walked through grown wheat, it's loud, especially when the wind blows through it. We walked to the end of the field, and there was a broken down old timey wooden wagon. A few hundred meters away was a strand of trees on a rise. We sat and played and did whatever little kids do. And I remember getting very afraid, like cold sweat chills. I also vaguely remember possibly seeing a dark man in the woods, standing, watching the two of us. This is in the middle of nowhere prairie farmlands. The next town is over an hour away. I can also remember how quiet everything was. The wind had stopped. Kerry and I had stopped talking. And then I remember us jogging back across the field. I have an already panicky feeling in my chest, thinking back to that moment. Did we really see a man? Or were we being stupid kids? I remember the fear I felt in that moment. It was so sunny and warm. Why did I get all those cold chills and sweats? Did anything else happen that I'm blocking from my memory? I live in a very old house, one of the oldest standing in my town. One morning, when I was 13, I woke up and walked down the hallway to get to my kitchen. On the way, I passed my parents' bedroom. I was half asleep, so I didn't notice anything wrong, till I came back with my cereal. Their door, which they keep closed, had two of its panels cracked down the middle, and was also knocked off its hinges. The lock mechanism was also destroyed. I was just terrified at what the hell had happened. I asked my parents right then what had happened. Apparently, in the middle of the night, a pounding just started at the door. Not knowing what was banging on their door in the middle of the night, they locked the door. The banging continued till the panels started to crack. Pain chipped and fell to the floor. The banging continued. The top hinge of the door breaks off. Mind you, this is an old house with heavy wooden doors. Scared shitless, my parents pressed up against the door, trying to keep whatever it was out of the room. Then they were knocked back by a powerful push and onto their bed and the floor. The log was ripped out of the wall, bringing shards of wood down with it. What was left of the door was pushed open, and there I was. I whispered, a door won't keep us out. Turning and sleepwalked back to my room. I have no recollection of anything. I also had no bruises, which I thought was strange, seeing as I bashed a door down. I still live in the house, and nothing like that has ever happened since. I do not remember dreaming about anything that night. When we were younger, about 13 or so, me and three friends were just goofing off at school as usual, riding our bikes and just doing what young teens do. We eventually rode past the old abandoned house that's local for us, which has basically been there since we can remember. My friend's parents who were here in the 70s can remember that house being abandoned since then also. Anyhow, we ride past it as per usual and decide to go a bit closer because we were always curious. As we approached it, we saw, or rather, thought we saw, someone peeking through the curtains. As curious teenagers, we naturally go closer to inspect and when we approached them, the curtains kind of drew back and the figure disappeared. Stumped, we decided to approach the veranda and that's when we heard a baby crying. The crying slowly progressed into a wail and eventually one friend had enough and knocked to see if anyone was home. 
after about five minutes of knocking and continued wailing, the door finally opened. It was a little lady who looked to be about 40 or so. My friend asked if everything was okay and if the baby was fine, and the lady simply told us to go away. My friend continued to ask if she needed help or anything, and that if everything was okay, and she continued with go away. This continued for about a minute until she closed the door on us, and the wailing became louder still. At this point, my head was screaming, run you dumb shit but rather my friend decided to knock again in fear the child was being neglected. Eventually, after a few knocks, the door just kind of opened. Not scary creaking open, but rather it was left unlocked. We, as dumb teenagers, walked in to see if everything was okay, partially due to curiosity. And as all four of us walked in, the crying stopped, and we stood in this abandoned house covered in dust, and everything was covered like it hadn't been inhabited in decades. We took a few steps forwards, and the crying began again. By this point, we decided we needed to find the child. So me and a friend went upstairs while the other two investigated downstairs. As we climbed the stairs, the crying got louder and louder, and we continued to search each room slowly. Eventually, we reached the last room and it was apparent the cod was in here. So we opened the door and investigated, and it was apparent the sound was coming from here. So we opened the door. The first thing we notice is that the room had nothing in it except for a baby carriage in the far left corner near the window. The crying was coming from there. We made our way and peeked over to find Nothing, but the crying was still there. My head started spinning, as I didn't know how to feel. I called up for my friends downstairs and they ran upstairs and saw, or rather, didn't see what we could see. They filled us in on what they saw downstairs, which was the woman walking into the kitchen downstairs. They followed her and she vanished. We all knew that this whole situation was screwed up and quickly ran out the front door. As we got onto our bikes, we looked back to see the door being closed slowly by someone and then locked. A few moments later, the curtains were pulled back by a woman holding a child, smiling. We rode hard and fast back home and didn't turn back. I didn't sleep much for a few days and a few years after the house got demolished, but people began seeing a woman holding a baby at the local park and bridge. That is, when you didn't see the kid who drowned in the sewers nearby. I hated that area, and I was so glad when we moved. And sometimes, I drive past it at night. And it has just the worst feeling. It's always too quiet. And it still scares me. Eleven years later. My dad lives in a small town of 500 people, most of which we are related to, and he knows a lot of the history of the town. When I was four, I went to my dad's for the weekend. He lived in a two-story house with his parents. My sister, two neighborhood kids and I were playing hide and seek in the dark on the second floor. I was the seeker and I was running around like crazy trying to find them. I opened the closet door, which attached the crawl space to the attic. I looked in. I could make out four sets of eyes, using the dim light from the street lights shining through the window. I screamed and ran downstairs, and explained to my Gigi that I saw Destiny's eyes. Braden's eyes, Randon's eyes, I couldn't see my eyes, but I saw one more pair. They looked all over and didn't find anyone upstairs. A few weekends later, I went upstairs again to listen to music with my uncle and saw a lady in a wheelchair sitting in her bedroom. I asked my Gigi about her and she said 
She must have seen her grandmother who died in the house. Many years ago now. But she was a lice lady. So I shouldn't be afraid. This happened several years ago. I was a teenager at the time. And my recollection of the events at hand is pretty good. I say this because a lot of people say they remember incidences that they can't explain from their childhood or when they were kids. Anyway, in order to completely understand this story, you need to know two very important things. This story is taking place in Southern Europe, where I am from. And it is a story that completely changed my view on life. It all begins with a small skin problem I had. Warts. I've had them since I could remember. They were always located on my hands, and always presented this terrible thing that I have that many others don't. My confidence levels were okay for a teenager at least, but I was always ashamed of my hands, and I didn't feel comfortable showing them in public. I would get nervous holding my girlfriend by her hand, and shaking hands with someone was always somewhat troublesome. Basically, you get the picture. Ham warts are a pain. So time goes by, and I realize I have to do something about this problem. I have grown up to enjoy two important things. Free healthcare, and an absolute total belief in science and medicine. So I go and visit a skin doctor. They schedule a treatment for me, and I get on with it. The treatments included burning the warts with different types of medication, as well as application of different types of creams and powders. This had been going on for several months, but the warts would simply not go away. Don't get me wrong, the creams and powders, as well as other treatments they tried gave solid results, but only for a brief period of time. A week or two later, my warts would resurface, and the whole conundrum would just start all over again. This had been going on for quite some time, and at that point, I started losing my patience. So I decided to visit a private skin clinic. It cost me a ton of money, but screw it. I had to deal with it since it was becoming unbearable. And after several treatments at the clinic, the results were basically the same. Yes, they had better equipment and fancier medicine, but the end result was the same. The warts would come back. This was the moment I was becoming desperate. It was also at a moment when I started questioning science. How is it possible we managed to send a man to the moon, yet we couldn't cure something as stupid as warts? At this point, my private doctor told me that she knows a guy who deals with some sort of enchanting, and that he knows these special techniques that can cure me in a day. I was super, but like, super skeptical towards this. And I completely shunned her story and went home. After a while, I told my parents about the person the doctor mentioned, and he lives in a village close to my hometown. I also told them that I completely ignored it, since I didn't believe in magic or anything like that. I was well educated, I was strong minded, and I would never believe in things that were scientifically unproven. Some time passes, and my doctor somehow gets in touch with my parents and tells them about this guy. Long story short, my problem grew and I was becoming impatient and severely displeased with my hand's appearance. So, I sat down and had a small conversation with my parents. We agreed that I would give this guy a chance. I was super desperate at this point, and I told myself, screw it. I may as well have a good laugh at this random village guy and his shenanigans. We got into the car and went to the village where he lived, and we were approaching his house, and we noticed many cars parked outside. Wow, so this guy's kind of famous. Some of the cars were pretty fancy, I'd tell you, 
and it was quite surprising seeing such nice cars in such a remote part of my country. We walked in, and the guy looked completely normal. Just one of those random dudes that you see every day. A guy that would just go out and buy bread and milk every day at his local joint. You know, that regular guy. So he asks me about my problem, and I explain it to him in great detail, and he just silently nods his head. He then says that I have to follow him behind his house, and that my parents should wait for me in front of the car. Of course, I was scared shitless at this point, but my parents gave me a reassuring look, and I decided to follow the dude. I guess nothing that bad could have happened 50 meters from where my parents were standing. We walked slowly while he was smoking a cigarette. At one point he stopped. He pointed me towards himself, yet brought my hand slightly upwards. They were being shined on by the moonlight. He then told me to be quiet and not to move. He grabbed my hands and started touching them very vaguely. I can't explain it. Just like barely touching them with the ends of his fingers. He was whispering something in a language I couldn't understand, and my feet were shaking. I honestly thought I was about to shit my pants. This went on for about 30 seconds, and in the end he brought his head down and took a deep breath, and told me that I needed to come tomorrow, and the day after as well. I was dead silent. We proceeded back to my parents and our car. They had a small talk, and once they paid him, as he only takes symbolic donations since his gift would be free to everyone, his words, we got in the car and drove ourselves home. It was dead silent the entire trip. What I had just experienced was completely otherworldly, yet I was still very skeptical. Finally, my parents asked me how it was, and I explained to them the entire thing in great detail, and once again, commented on that the guy is probably a fraud. There was no way on earth that this would work. Regardless, I decided to give him a chance, and agree to go on the two following days as requested. Both days of the routine were exactly the same. Go there, go behind his house, give him my hands, he whispers stuff for 30 seconds, the moon shines and he's done. All done. After my third visit, he told me that I am now cured, and that I should never have to worry about the warts again. I was like, yeah right. I've heard that story before. He just said to follow the moon and never worry again. Heavy stuff, I tell you. We pay him, and go back home. A couple of days pass and nothing changes. The warts were still there, and I was as displeased as before. Hell, even more so, this guy took our money for basically doing nothing. Absolutely nothing. On the fourth day, I think. I woke up having this weird feeling on my hands. The largest wart I had had shrunk significantly. I swear it was unbelievable. I looked completely different than what I did about five days ago. I immediately showed it to my parents, and we were all shocked. Yet it was still no time for celebration. Days went on, and I kind of stopped thinking about it, as I had a pretty important semester at school at that point. I would check every few hours or so, but really didn't bang my head about it. And approximately 10 days after the visits, all of the smaller warts that I had on my finger were gone. It was a miracle, I tell you. I have never experienced anything like that. I've never even seen anything like that. Long story short, 20 days after, all of my medium warts were gone as well and my two biggest ones were reduced to the size of something you wouldn't even consider a wart. A month later, my hands were clean, and looked like those of a piano artist. Today, more than seven years later, I still have no warts whatsoever. I have no idea what the guy did. I don't know whether it was magic or something else, but this is by far the biggest paranormal experience I've had and I must say it made me broaden my horizons extensively about folklore 
and old tales. I'd be more than happy. When I was a kid, my friend and I got bored during a dinner party my parents were hosting. So we messed around in my dad's painting studio. We somehow ended up getting a streak of white paint across a family portrait my dad was working on. Since it wasn't a Pollux abstract painting, the streak was very obvious. We were obviously freaked out and ran off. Then, we had the brilliant idea of taking the parents to the studio so we can pin the blame on one of them. So, we herded the parents into the studio to let them take a look. And guess what? The streak is gone. Now, we were even more freaked out. The painting's a bit complicated, so getting rid of that streak across it would take time. And it couldn't have been more than an hour since the incident happened. There was no trace of the streak anywhere. I lost touch with those friends for a while. And when we... And when we met again with one of them for the first time in about 15 years, the first thing he said was, Remember the freaky incident at your parents' place with the painting? Have you ever figured out what the hell happened? Of course, my dad could secretly have some speed painting ability, somehow managed to sneak away from dinner and fixed everything without telling us to mess with our heads. But screw it, to me, is going to be one of the great unsolved mysteries in my life. I've been having some strange experiences. They are difficult to explain. I honestly don't know if I'm going mad. Let me start at the beginning. Three years ago, my beloved girlfriend Vanessa died in a freak accident. Like any other death of someone close to me, it was truly devastating and heartbreaking. For the next two years, I couldn't bring myself to even look at another woman, let alone start over. It wasn't until I met a nice young woman whom I hit it off with very well. We just seemed to click, and there was definitely a spark between us, but I was still reluctant to make a move and become more than friends. My memories of Vanessa still bothered me, and I feared I would lose my new friend like I lost her. Then one night, I had a dream about Vanessa. In the dream, we were sitting down in the living room, talking. It seemed so real. I've missed you so much, I said. I know, I've missed you too, she replied. Life hasn't been the same since you've been gone. Sure, I still have friends and family, but it feels weird without you. Have you found another woman? She asked. I'm not sure I want to talk about it. You have found another woman, haven't you? She said in an inquiring but still calm manner. I guess I have. I do have feelings for her, and I feel eager to take the next step. But, but what? I don't wish to betray your memory, I said while barely holding back tears. My time in that world has ended. It's a new existence for me. And while I cherished our time together, I don't want you to be stuck in grief and agony forever. Not even for me. She will make you happy. Don't be afraid to move on. I opened my mouth to say more. But that's when I woke up. I was left to ponder what I had just gone over with myself in my subconscious. Maybe, in fact, it was time for me to move on and start over with my new friend. I confessed my feelings to her, and fortunately, she reciprocated. In time, we married, and I had fathered twin boys. 
my family life started out normal enough. But then things began to get a little strange. It happened one night when my twins were two. It was like most nights. I was in the living room playing with my boys after a hard day's work, while my wife was making our favourite dish. At some point, I could have sworn I heard a voice say, Alarm. Not functioning. I looked up to see where it was coming from. Did you say something, honey? I asked. No, she replied. Huh. Could have sworn I heard something. I went back to entertaining my sons, when that voice came again. It sounded more clear this time, and it was definitely female. Alarm, not functioning, the voice repeated. There it goes again. What? You didn't hear anything. It said alarm not functioning. I didn't hear anything. An awkward silence ensued. Then I heard those words a third time. Alarm, not functioning. Finally, I decided to get up and go check out the nearest burglar alarm. It was as if I felt compelled to obey that voice I had been hearing. I looked at the alarm next to the kitchen, and lo and behold, the machine was indicating that it was malfunctioning. Fortunately, I was mechanically inclined thanks to taking lessons from my father, who was an auto mechanic. In almost no time, I was able to fix it, and we proceeded to have a lovely dinner and went to bed. I didn't give the odd voice a second thought, until a few hours that is. That same night, we woke up to a blaring alarm noise. Someone had broken into our home, and whoever it was, the alarm was not deterring him, because I could hear him roaming around downstairs. My wife and kids hid in the master bedroom, while I grabbed the shotgun out of our closet. I opened my door, and saw a man dressed in all black reaching the top of the staircase. I pumped my shotgun, and told him, to freeze where he stood. Thankfully, he complied. The police eventually arrived and arrested the man. My wife and kids would end up staying at a motel for the night, but I chose to stay home and gather my thoughts. My mind wandered back to that voice that I was hearing earlier, the one telling me about the burglar alarm. I remember it sounded female. Then it occurred to me, exactly who it sounded like. Vanessa. But how? It didn't make any sense. Some weeks passed, and I was set for a job interview with a large technical firm. It was a truly exciting moment for me, as I was taking the next big step in my career to better support my family. And that's when something strange happened once again. I'm driving to the firm's large building downtown, humming my favourite songs to myself to pass the time, when I heard that voice again. Don't go in there. Hearing that voice caused me to turn around and look in the back seat to see if anyone else had somehow managed to enter my car. But no one was there. I entered the building parking lot and got out my briefcase. As I approached the building, I heard the voice again. Don't go in there. As before, it sounded strangely like Vanessa. I tried ignoring it once again, but as soon as I took one step closer, the voice became louder and more insistent. Don't go in. I stood there motionless. I wanted to go in, but as before, I seemed to feel compelled to obey what the voice was telling me. Frustrated, I turned around and walked away from the firm building and to a bar two blocks away. I began to wonder if I was going insane. Whatever was happening, I felt like I needed a drink, and badly. But before I could take a sip, I heard a very loud explosion. I ran outside the bar and saw something truly horrifying. 
the top floor of the very building where I had been scheduled for a job interview, was on fire. It was burning furiously, and many people were running in the streets screaming. My wife was relieved when I returned home safely, but my mind was all over the place. I didn't know how to make heads or tails of this. That night, I lie awake wide open, and unable to fall asleep. What the hell was wrong with me? First the burglar alarm and now this, and I'm hearing voices during these scenarios, and that voice just happens to sound like my dead girlfriend. I needed to clear my thoughts. I got out of bed, stepped into my car, and took myself out for a late night drive. It wasn't before long I began to hear the voice again. Danger ahead. I was nearing an intersection, but there appeared to be no other vehicles on the streets on this night. I ignored the voice, and continued driving. Danger ahead, the female voice said again. This just caused me to increase speed, somehow hoping it would make the voice go away. I had reached the intersection. Danger ahead. As I was passing through the intersection, I suddenly heard a loud crash and the noise of broken glass and twisted metal. My car was flipping over, and then I blacked out. The next memory was some kind of strange empty void. My vision was blurry, and I could once again make out the familiar voice. But this time, it was calmer and more reassuring. It's not your time yet. Your family needs you. Farewell. I love you. And with that, there was a bright flash of light, and I woke up on a hospital bed surrounded by doctors, my wife and my kids, as well as several close friends, all of whom were very relieved to see me still alive. If you're having a hard time believing this story, I don't blame you. I understand these accounts come off like the ramblings of a man barely holding on to his sanity. But I just can't ignore everything that happened. The burglar, the explosion, the vehicle running a red light and side wiping me. They all happened at precise moments where I heard a voice like Vanessa giving me a warning. With all that in mind, I also find myself rethinking that dream I mentioned earlier. Was that truly a dream? Or a message from beyond? I just don't know. Have I truly gone mad? Or is my dead girlfriend watching over me from beyond the grave? I was on Manasta's battlefield with my father when I was younger. We were sitting on the back of his tailgate eating McDonald's on the top of a hill looking at some cannons. It was foggy and misty out that day, with a slight chill, and all of a sudden, we see a man dressed in full Civil War attire waving at us, standing by the cannons. My dad had a pair of binoculars with him, and we got a closer look at the man. He appeared to be in a Confederate uniform and was standing stationary, only moving his arm to wave. It was a come here wave, so my dad thought there was a reenactment going on, and that the man needed help. So my dad walked down the main hall, while I watched with the binoculars. When my dad got close to the man, he stopped walking and had a confused posture. After a couple seconds next to the man, he turns around and sprints back to me. He proceeds to throw everything into the back of the truck and we leave the battlefield in a hurry. My dad said, while walking down there, the man slowly disappeared, and my dad said, he got the strangest feeling in his stomach and mad chills. To this day, my dad still gets chills and goosebumps telling the story. My dad saw combat in Vietnam, so he isn't an easy guy to scare. From my perspective, my dad was right next to the guy and never disappeared. We don't know what he saw, but I think it was a ghost. I have a ghost that occasionally 
visits me in my sleep and tells me things that either are about to happen or things that people are hiding from me. It is a female and from the looks of what she is wearing she is either from the 30s or 40s. A few things I can recall off the top of my head. When I was in high school she told me that one of my friends was going to break his leg playing a sport he usually doesn't. Next day, this happened. She told me that a girl I had a crush on was going to give me her number. It happened two days later. She told me when both of my dogs were going to die. She now also shows their spirits to me. They haven't left the house. They still act the same as if they were alive. Now, the creepiest one for me is that about three months ago, she told me that I was missing a female figure in my life. I questioned her, saying that if I should be married or something, and she laughed and said it was family and that I should ask my mother. I asked my mother about this and it turns out she had a miscarriage about two years before she had me. It was supposed to be a girl.